right now I like to throw this section out as what we call the question and answer period and if any of you have any questions you would like to yell out just raise your hand and scream them out and we'll see what we can do with them. What's your impression of education in America? What's my impression of education in America? Higher education, I think we've missed a boat on. For as elementary schools and high schools, they bringing in new techniques every day, every year, changing textbooks. And the average college in America have had the same system for about the last hundred years. I think. <laughs> you either flunking out. And I think it's about time that today we, in the colleges in the United States, need to wake up. For one, there's absolutely no need for a final exam at the end of every semester. I say this simply because there's so many kids across this country in colleges today that will float through a whole semester and cram for the last two weeks and make an A. What a marvelous thing and what top minds would we produce if you gave an exam at the end of the four years, which means you'd have to cram for four years. <laughs> we might not graduate as many, but for every one that would come out would be equal to 20 that's coming out now. These are the problems. You have so many kids that go to college to make A's, to make a grade, and all it amounts to if you want somebody to tell you what you're worth. It's so amazing. Check the records. How many of you learn to think, to challenge, and to think? The research. You are the minds of tomorrow. And you got a hell of a burden waiting for you when you get out. Because the old folks have made a lot of mistakes, baby. <laughs> and it's getting to the point today where certain things are beginning to catch up with us, with our educational system. And we're going to have to have a complete breakdown on it. And the sooner, the better. Anyone else? Yeah, could you offer it? Uh, could you tell us the difference between a Southern liberal and a Northern liberal? difference between a southern liberal and a northern liberal. I actually don't really see too much difference in the two of them. Most of the liberals say, what can we give you tomorrow? And the people that's hung up in this minority struggle is saying, give it to me today. <laughs> the Constitution of this great country mentions nothing about tomorrow. It says today. And this is what more people are beginning to wake up to today. Uh, the northern liberal and the southern liberal, to me, represents the third man in a fist fight. <laughs> we have a problem today of where this problem is left on you young people because the old folks couldn't solve it at all. And this is what you're going out here in the world with, this so-called racial problem that we have in America. It's just a matter, really, of being fair, fair with yourself, fair with other people. Let's remember one thing. You're an individualist first, an American second, and your nationality third. If you think our problems as an individual first, you get some strange answers. Everybody talks about General Walker 
participating down in Mississippi. I felt sorry for General Walker myself and damn glad he didn't go to jail. Because I said, if the United States government can pay General Walker for 20 years, top dollar as a general, to run a segregated army, then he go to Mississippi and do it free. They say he's crazy. I say he's not. We taught him that. <laughs> Everybody said, what a disgrace. The Mississippi cops didn't look for a race ride. I say, what's the difference in a Mississippi cop not looking for a race ride and a northern copy not looking for a bookie or a dope pusher? Just two cops that didn't do their work first before you inject anything into it. Everybody was happy that the Catholic Church kicked this woman out down in New Orleans. I felt sorry for her. Because when the church can go along with a racially segregated school to the year 1,962, then they ought to let her go along with them till her daughter graduates. <laughs> These are the many problems we have today. One, religion have failed us. And when I say religion have failed us, I mean exactly religion have failed us. I can take you back to Chicago Sunday morning and I can take you into 20 churches that they wouldn't let me in, but few taverns. Kind of makes you wonder which one of those buildings should the cross be on. <laughs> now, religion have definitely failed us. The day you young people start thinking, maybe the religious leaders are straightening up. They preach 24 hours a day, thy shall not kill. This is good if you're going to protect me with this theory. But don't preach to me, thy shall not kill, and the minute America gets into war, they knock that Bible out of your hand and my hand and send both of us over there. <laughs> Call me a soldier and you a chaplain. And I want to know what's the difference a man break in my house and rape my daughter, my wife, and you tell me thy shall not kill. But you okay me to go lay on some cold ground and shoot at some cat I never met before that might not do the things this guy done to me. So religion have failed us. Every time we look around, we're talking about missionary work, going up on the Indian reservation. That's a disgrace. You ought to go up there and bring them down. These are the jobs that you young people have. The Indians that's alive in America today was born under the United States Constitution. They are Americans first. We had to fight Russia tonight and lost. They wouldn't consider the Indians as being non-Americans. And it's a dirty shame when you think a country as great as this have still kept these Indians up on the reservation as long as they have. And you have states right now that's still trying to get legislation through to still misuse the Indian today. These are the problems that confront you young people today. This is why you're going to have to think, because we made a lot of mistakes. This is why we're going to have to wake up and think. I don't know how thorough you read the newspaper report on that airplane that crashed down in Miami early this week. Did you notice that one little section where they said they closed up that Indian school and used it as a morgue? I wonder, had it been reversed, had that school been closed up? We don't think. The only place in your life you've ever participated in a fire drill is in a public place. And yet and still we lose 99% of the people that burn to death. It happens in the home, but we've never thought about having a fire drill in a home. We spend billions of dollars every year on civil defense. We have civil defense buildings all over America, and do you know they closed on weekends? <laughs> like Khrushchev just fights a five-day week. <laughs> we have a lot of waking up to do because we made so many mistakes. This is what you young people go out in the world with on your shoulders today. All of our mistakes. Anyone else? What do you think of the Muslim cult? The Muslims? 
For one, the Muslims have existed for something like 35 years. And the Negro actually knew nothing about them until the white man put him on his television show. <laughs> 35 years the Muslims have been in existence and we didn't know anything about it until the leading white universities in America started inviting them on campus to speak. Not one Negro college in America have ever had a Muslim on the campus to speak. This is a myth. I don't know why. The black Muslims never knew they had 200,000 members till the New York Times told them they did. <laughs> the Muslims represent a big joke to me because all my life, I've been told, leave that switchblade at home, quit drinking and acting a damn fool, and leave that white woman along and we'll accept you. The Muslims decided to do that and they called it un-American. <laughs> so the Muslims represent a corn on my foot. If you have a corn on your foot and you go to the best foot specialist in the world and he removes that corn, if you put it back in that tight shoe, you're gonna get another corn. So what do you wanna get rid of first, the shoe or the corn? You know, you look around at the so-called problems we have today in America and it just frightens you to death. It wants you, makes you wonder about the intelligence level of this country and of the whole world. This racial problem we consider a racial problem could be solved tonight if one seven-headed idiot floated down here and called us Earth people, that's what we would be. And Kennedy and Khrushchev would be sitting at a table five hours from now saying, what can we do with this thing? <coughs> That's the problem. Everybody's fighting something and there's really nothing to fight. No real racial problem. You never heard of a race ride in the wintertime. If you lived in the state of Illinois and you decided to drive your car to certain sections of the South, where well, they'd see that Illinois license plate and underneath it, Land of Lincoln, they would shoot through your car. <laughs> but they won't get rid of the $5 bills that have Lincoln's picture and his name on them. <laughs> so it's amazing, this great problem we're supposed to have, it really don't exist. Because it could be solved tomorrow. But we passed the buck on it. We said, well, it's, it's not me. The old folks teach us hate. Old folks can't tell you who to marry. If your parents can't teach you who to love, you know damn good and well. They can't teach you who to hate unless you kind of wanted to do it a little bit yourself. <laughs> well, these are the problems we have today. No, I would never go into politics because when you go into politics, you lose your freedom of speech. <laughs> it's a lot different when you have to think for a group of people than it is when you think as an individualist. The polit political setup in this country is the biggest myth in the world. Everyone walks around this great country believing the greatest right you have in America is the right to vote. And the greatest right you have in America is the right not to vote and won't anything happen to you. But as long as they can keep you believing the greatest right you have is the right to vote, then they can keep you voting for the lesser of the two evils. <laughs> That's why we can't get good government from the national level to the state level to the local level because we're so busy believing the greatest right we have is the right to vote. We say, well, he's no good, but he's better, so you put him in so he don't steal all the money. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. What is, what is your impression of Adam Clayton Powell? Adam Clayton Powell? He's a hell of a politician. 
I met him several times, and on one incident, I told him where it was one little angle I differed with him on, and that was his hard fight to keep the school bill watered down on federal aid to schools. He feels that he's right in saying no school should receive money that's segregated. I say, this is good. You tell the people in the state of Mississippi and Georgia, as long as your schools are segregated, you can't receive any federal money for schools. But he sits right there in the Congress and let them give him money to build a federal highway. So if you're going to take my tax money and build a highway in the state of Mississippi where a cat can travel 10 miles to lynch me, then give them kids some money. <laughs> Did you have a Well, I don't think it's really that much different. The only difference between the Negro in the South and the Negro in the North is you're a little bit safer up here. <laughs> in the South, they don't care how close the Negro gets as long as he don't get too big, and up North, they don't care how big the Negro gets as long as he don't get too close. We look down and we talk about the South. You realize the state of California has more segregated schools than Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi put together? <laughs> because if you have segregated schools, you have to have segregated neighborhoods. And wherever you have racial tension, you have people that can't think. You say a Negro problem, there's no Negro problem in America. Show, you, show me a Negro problem in America and I'll show you dumb white leadership. <laughs> Governor Barnett, any incident you find, we don't control anything. So we can't have a problem. goes, as long as we hung up in this racial fight and this racial struggle, we can't think. You have a, one of the largest states, the largest state in America, right here in California, and you had a football team in this state that got killed in a plane wreck, and they hadn't received one penny. It's a disgrace to the state of California. The insurance company backed out. The airline went bankrupt. And the state said we didn't have anything to do with it. But if one of your athletes in this school here go to Michigan and stick up a bank, the state bars will be here talking to the president. You have all those kids that got killed on that plane wreck representing this state of California in a football game. And this great state of California is fixing to adopt Chile and have forgot about their own. said, what lies ahead for the Negro today? We have a new Negro today. We have new minority groups today. 20 and 30 years ago, the Negro had an empty stomach. Today, his belly is full and his mind is hungry. Man reacts much different behind a full stomach than a hungry mind. I don't think the Negro have ever wanted anything but just to be fair. Keep me a second-class citizen if you must, but please don't make me pay first-class taxes. <laughs> Send me to the worst schools in America if you must, but when I go in to apply for a job, please don't give me the same test you give that white boy. <laughs> give me the roughest job in the steel mill right next to the furnace, but please don't go out and tell people I stink. It's a matter of being fair. The time I pick up the paper, I read about a Negro crime rate. I say, what Negro crime rate? John Graham put 40 sticks of dynamite in his mother's luggage and blew up a whole plane. Every time Bobby Sinder Kennedy mentioned the syndicate, it's not us. I say, what Negro crime rate? In the history of the world, man has always had three ways to survive. Work, bar, or steal. If you don't give me a job, won't put me on relief, I'll take it from you. 
This is human nature. All we want is to be fair. Every time you pick up the paper, you read about Negro women with illegitimate kids, and who wrote the article? Some chick living in a neighborhood where they got abortion credit cards. This is all the Negro is after today. Negro walk downtown and steal something, he's a rogue. White guy go downtown and steal something, he's a kleptomaniac. <laughs> we draw the line. We forget there's not a Negro crime rate, it's an American crime rate. It's not Negro women with illegitimate kids, it's American women with illegitimate kids. We are Americans. The only time the average Negro becomes an American is when he leaves the country. Then he becomes an American. We are fixing to go to Russia to run a track meet. The American track team will run against the Russian track team. And it's a disgrace to think a Negro can go to Russia and run in an integrated track meet, but he can't go to the state of Louisiana because they have a law that prevents integrated sports. These are the problems we have here. I like all fighters, man. That's the only way we can get Negroes on television is Saturday night fight. <laughs> Do I have one more question? Yes. Do you consider integration be uh, the direct opposite of segregation? Integration being the direct opposite of segregation? No. You, you're dealing with two different things now. You, segregation is one thing. Racial segregation is something else. To go into a TB ward in a hospital where they put the patients over in this one se section, that's segregation. To put a person over in a hospital in one section because of race, that's racial segregation. The world could never survive without prejudice. It's racial prejudice. The, the two are so close together. To look at you and assume you're a hell of an athlete is because I look at you the way you walk, this would be prejudice. To assume that you're a hell of an athlete because you're a Negro, this is racial prejudice. It's a very fine line between the two of them. You want to? You play a musical instrument? No, all of us haven't got rhythm, baby. <laughs> Do I plan to write a book? No, I, I, I do a lot of research. I have a lot of research staff. My staff consists of about 12 people only to find out certain problems. Like right now, I'm researching this plane wreck here and I'm gonna give it to a national magazine and maybe some of your political leaders will wake up and do something about this. I was in the state of Mississippi. I, I send the research fellows down there and I had to go down myself because the things that go on in the state of Mississippi is absolutely unbelievable. I found out about a young man by the name of Clyde Kennard. I don't know if any of you in the house is familiar with this case. This is a Negro that registered to go to the University of Southern Mississippi three years ago. The day he walked on campus they found five dollars five sacks of stolen chicken feed on his farm. The next day, he was sentenced to seven and a half years at hard labor in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. When I found out about this, I sent my team of researchers in to Mississippi. It was very shocking, the things we found out. I made a vow in the nightclub in Chicago, New Year's Eve that my New Year's resolution was to see to it that Clyde Kennard gets out of the penitentiary. I had a young man from the press say, well, how can you do this? You're not a lawyer. I get the facts, and I expose the facts. America will get him out. This is the faith I have in America.
Well, if I never lived to see another New Year's resolution come true, this one happened. We gathered up the information on this. The best chicken feed on the market is Purina. Sells for $4.50 a site. This was a lesser grade they claimed they found. They sit the value at it at $5 a site to get a $25 felony rap on him. He'd been in jail two and a half years as of three weeks ago, and he had never been allowed a visitor. I found a sister of his that lived in Chicago, bought a plane ticket, put her on the plane, and gave her a list of questions to ask him. Not until then did the world know that he was dying from cancer. The day she arrived there, two convicts had to pull him out of bed, dress him, bring him down to the visiting room. The next day, he was back on hard labor. On gathering these facts, giving them to the press, exposing them, taking them into Washington, D.C., to the Justice Department. After it was exposed, and as I said, America will get him out. You did. The Thursday, I left the Justice Department to the millions of other people that had read about the case. By the time my plane had landed in Chicago, Clyde Kennard had been released. Governor Barnett gave a direct order to take him to the University of Mississippi Hospital. They had to go out in the field and get this young man off of hard labor. They gave him five pints of blood. Three hours later, Governor Barnett told him he was free. He didn't have to go back to the penitentiary. Everyone was happy that I knew, but it created a problem. Because as long as he wasn't a convict, the University of Mississippi Hospital didn't have to treat him. So we had to send a jet plane down to Mississippi that night, pick him up, bring him back into the hospital, and now he's in the hospital in the University of Chicago, where they operated on him this morning, and they give him six months to live. But he's out. These are the things that's going on, not in the state of Mississippi, but in America. I just airlifted something like 14,000 pounds of food to an area in Mississippi where the average white man makes $300 a year. $300 a year. And we can't load our care packages on these foreign planes quick enough. This is what's going on in the state of Mississippi today. This is what's happening in America today. When you get aggravation in one Jewish temple, when they ride in one American school, peoples all over the world are led to believe that this happened every hour, every second in America. This is the job you young people have. Change the image of this country because these monsters are beginning to slip up on us every day. A white man in America will go to Moscow, Russia, and walk all over Russia, pitch black midnight, and tell Khrushchev to go to hell, but he's scared to come in a Negro neighborhood after dark, and he owns it. <laughs> these are the problems we have. This is what you're going out to the world. What do you think of the John Birch Society? And you're going to have little organizations that spring up as long as you have a democracy. Everyone worries about the American Communist Party. Do you realize there's not one American communist you could give $10 million to and tell him to go to Russia? <laughs> he wants to be a communist under this good constitution. We have time for one more question, and then we're going to, yeah. What do you think of the American uh, College Fraternity and Sorority System? What do, uh, say it again, will you? What do I think of the American College Fraternity and Sorority System? I think it's a wonderful thing. For one, you get to know people a little bit better, especially for the larger universities where you can get into closed groups. But it's a disgrace, the amount of racial segregation that goes on in sororities and fraternities in the northern colleges today. 
This is a disgrace. We had an incident that made national news last year, a sorority where the Negro girl registered to join in Wisconsin. And they made a lot of stink about it, and they tried to get to the president of the national president who lived in Long Island, New York. Do you remember that story? And they knocked on her door for four days and couldn't get to her. And when she finally opened the door, she says, none of your business how we run our sorority. Sorority incident happened in Wisconsin. The national president lived in Long Island, New York. And the same answer she gave didn't sound too much different from the answer Barnett was given. Well, it's something that you young kids are going to have to clean up. We've waited for the older people too long. They haven't cleaned it up. You're the one that's going to suffer by this. You're the one that the whole world looks to today. These are the problems we have. Again, I'd like to say you've been a very wonderful audience. It's my pleasure to be here. Good luck. God bless you. Thank you.